Welcome to Energy Talks, a regular podcast series with expert discussions on power system testing topics. My name is Scott Williams from the podcast team at Omicron, and I will be your host. Hello, everyone. We are all aware about the present and increasing risk of devastating wildfires all over the world, especially those recently experienced in Australia and the Western United States, to mention only a few examples. Prolonged dry conditions in these regions of the world have greatly increased the risk of wildfires starting and spreading with alarming speed. Wildfires cause not only massive destruction to the power system infrastructure, Often that same infrastructure is discovered to be the initial source of the fire. After all, it only takes a spark in dry and windy conditions. In this episode, we will learn how Pacific Gas and Electric Company, a major U.S. utility in Northern California, is implementing their zero-tolerance policy for wildfire sparks caused by downed power lines. Specifically, we will find out how reclosure controls and the regular testing thereof play an important role in the electrical grid to reduce fire risk and increase safety. Joining me to discuss this topic is Justin Henson, Distribution Line Technician Specialist at Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Justin is based near Sacramento in Northern California. Hello, Justin. Welcome to Energy Talks. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Also joining me is Robert Wang, Omicron Product Manager for Reclosure Control Testing Solutions, Robert is based in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you for joining us, Robert. Thank you, Scott. It is also a pleasure to be here. Thank you both for being here for this discussion. Robert, you are a product manager for reclosure control testing solutions at Omicron. In general, what role do reclosure controls play in the power system, and why is it important for them to be tested? That's a really good question, Scott. Um, Reclosers are medium voltage electric switches very similar to a circuit breaker. Um, These reclosers shut off electric power when an abnormal event occurs on a protected distribution line. But unlike a circuit breaker, which trips and remains open, a recloser can close automatically to determine if this abnormality on the line has been removed. It's essential to point out that between 80 to 90% of faults that occur are temporary and can be caused by such events as, you know, heavy winds blowing branches onto a line or lightning strikes or any kind of cute little critters that might choose to nibble on the line, such as birds Mm -hmm. or squirrels. Um, These temporary faults, like their name suggests, um, will remove themselves from the affected line if power flow is shut off before any kind of permanent damage occurs. Reclosers also have an electronic component called a recloser control. This control is very similar to a protective relay um, and can sense analog signals such as voltage and current. Mm -hmm. Um, Monitoring these analog values is quite essential in helping the control determine if there's a fault on the protected line or any kind of abnormal event happening. The control also has additional signals which it can uh, it can send and monitor, including you know trip signals, close signals, as well as the auxiliary breaker statuses such as the 52A and B. Um, it's crucial to test these controls to make sure that they are operating according to the manufacturer's specification prior to the installation in the field and after installation to guarantee that the correct settings have been um, applied to these controllers. And then after that, it is always recommended to perform periodic maintenance to verify that the controllers continue to operate correctly. Okay, interesting. What do reclosure controls have to do with wildfire safety at utilities? Well, we have seen many reclosure control manufacturers are implementing new technological features to help minimize the risk of fires. Um, This can be through, you know, either faster fault clearing schemes, high impedance fault detection in order to identify downed conductors, as well as distribution automation schemes uh, using communication. So all of these kind of technologies can be integrated into a reclosure control to help utilities mitigate fires. Okay, why is wildfire mitigation such an important topic at electrical utilities in North America? 
So this might be a touchy subject, um, but with global warming and prolonged periods of drought, we have continued to see that the wildfire season increases in duration, mm -hmm. um, especially in the western part of the U.S. So these wildfires can cause devastating damage. And as we have seen in many cases, such as the fires in California and even the more recent ones in Colorado, that even an individual spark can cause nearby dry vegetation to catch flame, which can then lead to, you know, total destructions of communities as well mm -hmm. as harm individuals. Yeah, it's definitely a, a major concern these days. How did you come into contact with our other guest, Justin, from PG&E? Was it in this context? Oh, boy. I, I cor Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I think that we met some years ago, three or four years ago, um, actually prior to me becoming product manager for our Recloser Control Testing Solutions. Um, That's right. If I remember correctly, I was out in California at PG&E to give a training on how to use Argo 400. Um to a group yeah. of the DLTs, and Justin was the uh, PG&E internal key trainer. Um, since meeting Justin at that training, we've worked on a variety of projects together from creating job aids for the DLTs to use, um, as well as working on debugging various test procedures, prototyping new accessories, even co-presenting at ARCO 400 user sessions. Mm -hmm. And recently, um, in collaborating on the Omicron Magazine article, it's been a pleasure to work with Justin, and I hope that we have more opportunities to collaborate in the future. Justin, please tell our listeners about the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, also known as PG&E. What regions does it cover, and how many customers does it serve? Yeah, of course. Uh, where do I start with an over 100-year-old private utility, right? Like, there's so much history there. I do know that PG&E incorporated in California in 1905 is one of the largest combination natural gas and electric utilities in the United States. Um, there's approximately uh, 25,000 employees who carry out PG&E's primary business, which is the transmission and delivery of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, our company provides natural gas and electric services to approximately 15 million people throughout no, yeah. a 70,000 square mile service area in Northern and Central California. Uh, our, our partners to the South are SoCal Edison and SDG&E, San Diego mm -hmm. Gas and Electric. They're mm -hmm. the next two biggest utilities in California. Uh, we're all governed by the California Public Utility Commission which was formed a little over 20 years ago. But here at pg e we have more than 141,000 circuit miles of electric lines that serve our 5.3 million customer accounts, ranging from you know the smallest little house on the prairie to some of the largest tech companies on the planet. So just, just Google it with your Apple iPhone if you catch my drift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, definitely impressive. Justin, what are your responsibilities as a distribution line technician specialist at PG&E? Yeah, of course. Um, so to better understand the role of a distribution line technician specialist, I think it's first important to know what a distribution line technician is, right? Um, Definitely. Here at PG&E, the, the DLT, as we say, is responsible for maintaining all the company's pole-mounted, pad-mounted, and underground line control device equipment you know, such as line reclosers, switches, interrupters, capacitors, and regulators. I call them the Fab Five. It's the ones we mostly deal with. Mm -hmm. And we have about 55 DLTs in our system today. And these individuals are all the ones performing all the programming, testing, and commissioning of these LCDs outside the fence, as we say, uh, not to be confused with our substation department. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the distribution department. So my role as a specialist for the group carries the responsibility of maintaining and creating all the DLT pg &E Academy training, as Robert mentioned, um, creating the standards and procedures and sort of work management as it relates to these line control devices for the DLTs. And that said, one of my major roles in dealing with line control devices is the cr uh, creation and uh, of these pre-commissioning test plans for pg and &E's distribution protection and automated LCD field equipment. Okay. Justin, located in California, you have certainly experienced the increased risks 
which have resulted in several devastating wildfires in recent years. Mm -hmm. What role do electric utilities play in the risk of wildfires? Yeah, you know, utilities have always had to deal with power lines causing fires. I mean, this is our technology as a society for the last 150 years, easy, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. I think the first legit transmission power line to go up in the u.s was in 1889 near near oregon uh our our state to the north of us here in california but to date i mean we literally string up hot wires on poles in the air energize them at ridiculous voltage levels hundreds of thousand times greater than the voltage in your home and pray that outside forces don't take them out but you know the only difference in fires of the past versus the type of wildfires we're seeing now is that the the fuel from years of drought and, and has created a condition where just one spark is, as Robert mentioned, on a bed of dry grass can be the beginning of the next big wildfire. Sure. Um, that and here in California, the last five years especially, we've seen 100 mile an hour wind storms with very low humidity uh, be the means of spreading these fires. Um this is what we're now faced to mitigate. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very challenging. This has resulted in terminology that I, as a layman, have not heard before, and this is wildfire mitigation. Could you describe what this terminology means for electric power utilities? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, well, you remember Smokey the Bear, right? Right. You can prevent forest fires. Uh, Well, the U.S. Forest Service started that campaign in 1944 as a means to educate the public on how they can be a part of the solution. Um, I think being mindful of how to prevent fires that spread uncontrollably uh, is a good thing. So uh, prevention is just one part of the mitigation program that we're focused on here at Mm -hmm. PG&E. We know fires will always be a threat to our customers when the power is on. So we're instituting programs that help mitigate the potential uh, for a down power line wildfire spark, but also preemptively taking measures to shut down the power before it even has a chance to do so. Yeah, okay. I understand that PG&E has a zero tolerance policy for wildfire sparks caused by down power lines. Could you tell us about what PG&E is doing to implement this policy? Yeah, thanks, Scott, for asking. This is something that we're extremely passionate about here at PG&E. Since 2017 and and some of the the beginning of some of the most destructive wildfires that California has ever seen, PG&E is committed to our customers and the CPUC that we will do everything in our power to prevent wildfires. And part of that commitment was the accelerated installation of hundreds of additional SCADA devices to minimize the impacted areas, Mm -hmm. Uh, system hardening efforts to strengthen our poles, cover our overhead power lines with insulation, and converting overhead lines into the underground, which which we're really in full force uh, right now on both transmission and distribution. Um, We put together programs with our local partners across the system to clear vegetation and the underbrush from beneath and around our power lines, Mm -hmm. Uh, not to mention the installation of hundreds of weather stations and high def cameras to increase the visibility of wildfire threats due to these uh, changing weather conditions. Okay, so PG&E is one of many electric utility companies that are enforcing such policies. In your opinion, why is this so vital for utilities, not only in California? And what do you consider to be the most important aspects of such policies? Yeah, uh, I I think PG&E is leading the way in the space of wildfire mitigation, but not by choice originally, to be honest. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I I think because of the enormous service territory that we cover, sheer geographics and and the condition California has put herself in over these years of 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 neglect of of the underbrush and not uh, being mindful of of climate change and so on. You know, we we've been put in the spotlight for how we've uh, been handling these very crucial situations. And like I said before, we're living in the new norm 
that forces us really to rethink how we deliver and maintain power to our customers. Safety is always number one. Yeah. If that means shutting the power down before disaster strikes, we're going to do it. And sure. I think we have to look uh, now at having um, power to energize our homes as a commodity or a privilege, really, rather than our right to always have the lights on. It's a hard statement, but the fact is the inconvenience of not having power will never be greater than the safety of our customers and to the public. So Justin, as a distribution line technician specialist, how are you involved in implementing and enforcing optimized fire safety in the power grid at PG&E? Yeah, sure. Um, my job as the DLT specialist is to make sure these very important customers stay in power at the mainline protective level and are safe when our grid is threatened by outside forces. Uh, that said, there would be no DLT specialists if there were no DLTs. And the DLT, the distribution line technician, has their part in programming and testing our protective devices like reclosers and interrupters. Mm -hmm. And as the specialist, I take great pleasure in creating the test plans uh, for the DLTs to execute and am very proud of the training program I helped create and maintain that ensures our DLTs are at the top of their class when it comes to interfacing with line control devices. Oh, that's great. Justin, could you tell us about the types of line control devices and systems used for wildfire mitigation in the grid? Yeah. Well, we've talked a little bit about reclosers and interrupters, and as they are the protective devices that interrupt the fault conditions on the lines, but we also install switches and or sectionalizers to isolate trouble locations so power can be rerouted from other sources to energize our customers. Mm -hmm. At PG&E, um, anyways, we instituted a policy that we will apply SCADA or remote operations uh, to all of these protective and sectionalizing devices. This way, we have an increased visibility and control of our grid from a centralized operational standpoint. We've also began to strategically install microgrids throughout the system so that mm -hmm. when the primary source of power for a town or a small community is interrupted, we can re-energize them at the local level with generated power. And we do that by way of um, temp gen is what we call it, uh, bringing mm -hmm. diesel generators and on, on trucks. And we energize um, from them through our circuit breakers and line reclosers to bring power to these folks that have been cut off from the pg e main source. Okay, so um, kind of like uh, emergency generators. Backup generators. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. We've then taken it to the next level and am very excited uh, next week at the uh, seventh annual Omicron uh, recloser event to share with uh, the group there a very specific microgrid project we've done in Northern California uh, near Humboldt University. Uh, we call RCAM, uh, which is the Redwood Coast. Um, uh, airport microgrid. It, it's mainly for uh, a, a very important customer, the airport up there and, and a few others to keep them on uh, locally with generated power when they have been cut off. Uh, we've partnered with Tesla and they've um, provided uh, their batteries and, and solar panels uh, to be the means of this um, microgrid and uh, it's a very, very um, interesting project. Uh, uh, it's very unique and one of its kind here at pg e And we're looking forward to uh, continuing that partnership and installing more of these um, advanced microgrids as time goes on. Okay. So pg e has an official public safety power shutoff or PSPS mm -hmm. program. How are mm -hmm. line control devices and systems used to respond quickly to safely shut off power and restore power? Yeah, good question. You know, again, as part of our commitment to our customers and the CPUC, uh, 
there was an accelerated installation of hundreds of additional sectionalizing devices uh, each year for our power, our, our public safety power shutoff program, PSPS, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. At PG&E, our line reclosers or LRs, as we call them, are all multifunctional devices that can serve as a recloser, interrupter, switch, sectionalizer. Having that versatility of these modes all in one device, you know, it allows us the opportunity to better fine tune and protect and coordinate our system. Uh, the PSPS program contributed, I think, roughly a thousand, well over a thousand at this point, additional devices since 2018 to this effort in conjunction with the over 1300, probably 1400 weather stations mm -hmm. uh, that we've installed since 2018. Uh, we can now better monitor and forecast severe weather threats that inform our operational decisions like shutting down the power before disaster strikes. And sure. so the more SCADA LRs and other sectionalizing devices you have on the grid, the smaller these impacted shutdown areas become, you see. Yeah. So uh, that said, when it comes time to safely turn the lights back on and, um, you know, after the storm clears, uh, we've instituted a very methodical approach to patrolling our de-energized power lines before we hit the switch, turn it back on. So in doing so, uh, we have reported uh, over the last few years, hundreds of locations where we found down power lines or trees in the lines or, or something obstructing our power lines uh, that would have otherwise had the potential to be the cause of the next big wildfire had, had we not shut down the power preemptively. Uh, that's very interesting. How do you monitor that line control devices installed in the field will be able to reliably perform when required? Yeah, well, back in the day, as they say, uh, we had to send field employees to go out to these line control device locations and and retrieve downloads and data for the engineers to analyze. And that was our only means of, of capturing that data. Uh, that could take some time and at the customer's expense. But now with the expansion of SCADA and remote capabilities, our engineers and control center operators have 24 seven visibility and control over these devices. Mm -hmm. And that helps expedite the restoration of power to our customers and provides real time data in case adjustments need to be made on our grid. What types of tests do you perform on this equipment to ensure reliable operation? And how often do you perform these tests? Yeah, so we do all the standard ANSI IEEE required testing to ensure equipment is fit for service and mm -hmm. with an annual maintenance and inspection program to make sure these devices are always in top operating condition. Um, but specifically for LCDs and, and line control devices and, and the distribution line technicians that perform the work, we have three major work methods we follow. Mm -hmm. Pre-commissioning, commissioning, and data management. LRs, for example, during the pre-commissioning uh, in a DLT shop environment require that all diagnostics and functional tests be ran on the LR apparatus, as, as Robert mentioned earlier. You got to think of it as one device with two major parts, the apparatus that sits on the top of the pole that actually does the heavy lifting and, and, and energizes and and interrupts faults, but there's also the control. And more importantly, I think that LR control, the brains, right? It receives a separate test that validates the actual settings file being utilized in the field. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not sure how other utilities operate, but here at PG&E, we feel it's very important to test the actual file that's going to be used in the field as opposed to a generic template uh, to validate each controller. And, and this way, you you kind of kill two birds with one stone here. You, you prove the microprocessor relay and its functionality, but even more importantly, and where we find uh, more uh, situations and, and issues and so on, is the engineered site-specific settings. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, there's, there's various reasons for that, but, you know, I, my hat's off to the engineers who create these very complex schemes 
uh, after doing circuit studies and so on um, from their from their office, um, you know, these are, you know, simulated programs that help them uh, create these very complex schemes. But really, you know, it, you find out how it's really going to work when you put it out in the field and put it to the test, right? So sure. um, yeah. after the LR is installed in the field, the DLT is then able to skate a commission the LR into service. And this is the second stage of the LCD process that we call commissioning. Uh, during the final ongoing stage, the third stage, which we call data management, the DLT periodically and on an as-need basis visits the LR to program, inspect, and test uh, the device. Um, as outages and other events occur on the system, it's important to not only retrieve downloads from the LR, but in some cases, test the controller with reproduced event conditions on the secondary to confirm uh, expected behaviors in the relay. Okay, interesting. I think this answers the question I was just about to ask you. And of course, when this equipment is installed in multiple locations, it must be a challenge to keep track of operation status throughout the grid. And so you referred to that. Could you elaborate a bit more about that? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad I'm not an engineer because that's their job. <laughs> like I said, <laughs> SCADA and remote ops play a huge role in maintaining these devices, uh, but we have the very best engineers in the industry, in my opinion, that are constantly performing circuit studies to increase the safety and protection on our lines. Uh, they, as well as our control center operators, are the eyes in the sky that help direct the DLTs, who are the hands and feet of the engineers and operators governing our system. Interesting. What role does Omicron play in helping you to ensure that your line control devices are fit for service in the field? Yeah, Omicron, I know, has tons of equipment that our substation department, for example, uses, and, and as well as our applied technology services uh, group um, that they use to maintain and, and uh, energize in the field, um, the equipment. Um their products are, are user-friendly and intuitive, in my opinion, and uh, to the work that we perform, um, not to mention the stellar customer service and support that they provide. And that, that has been a growing thing that I'm very appreciative to Robert and, and his team for uh, in working with them over the years. You know, I've been mm -hmm. very pleased uh, with the working relationship that Omicron has developed with PG&E over the years. And is the reason for our continued business with them as a customer for sure. What types of Omicron equipment do you use for the performance testing of your line control devices and what benefits do they offer you to do your job? Yeah, well, for the DLTs, uh, we only are using really one Omicron product at this time and that is the Arco 400. Mm -hmm. As the specialist, I do work with our applied technology services team, like I'd mentioned, to onboard new products. And in those cases, we use the CMC356 unit as well. And again, Substation has other Omicron units that perform contact resistance, micro-ohm testing, and so on, which is really cool uh, that I've used. Uh, but they're a little bit more ahead of us uh, in distribution. Uh, by way of diagnostics, mm -hmm. uh, testing for for apparatuses, I'd say substation is, uh, but but we are picking up speed and and being introduced to more uh, equipment each day. So as for us, the the compact plug and play design of the Arco test set is awesome, and and it allows us the comfort and ease of performing shop type testing thirty feet in the air from a bucket truck. Interesting. Um, the, okay. Yeah, I mean it's great. It's uh, other uh, products that are comparable to the Arco 400, um, you know, provide really good uh, program functionality, but they're lacking in, in the way of the hardware. A um, lot of banana plugs, spaghetti, as we call it, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, as opposed to the Arco, which is a uh, harness, is a harness design, which is very cool. And I appreciate Omicron for the years of um, work that they put into these adapters. You know, they're not just 
wires, right? They got circuit boards in them and they're very uh, intentionally programmed to match uh, the configurations of various uh, recloser products, which is really cool. So um, as far as the programming on it, a uh, big fan of the manual mode features. This allows us to very quickly recreate an event and make sure the controller is fit for service. Mm -hmm. uh, but mainly we're executing uh, in ARCO control the RICO plans uh, for our new equipment that we onboard. And that's one of my major roles is creating all the RICO plans uh, for the company uh, to be executed on our distribution equipment. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I have one last question for you, Justin. Thank you yeah. for bearing with me in all these questions. Um, in our recent Omicron magazine, uh, uh, the first issue, uh, 2022, there is an article uh, with an interview with you about this topic. And in it, you mentioned the that of equal importance to system safety is the reliability of a self-healing grid. I like that. Could you tell us what you meant by this? Yeah, I, I wish I could claim it, but it's a term that was uh, coined by uh, some of my partners here at PG&E. Um, we talked about the importance of safety, but as I stated and you mentioned, um, reliability is, is number two for us. Mm -hmm. um, we want people to be in power. We want their lights on. We want them to be safe. We want them to be comfortable. Um, and this is the world we live in, right? And so we need to think outside of human intervention to turn the lights back on. We are in a automated world and that's exactly what we're doing here at PG&E, um, exploiting uh, automation in, in its best form to have a reliable self-healing grid as, I, as, as it was stated. And what that means is that the human intervention is uh, taken out of the initial equation when an event happens on the line. So mm -hmm. um, some of your listeners may, may be familiar with uh, Flizzer, uh, fault location, isolation, sectionalizing, and restoration. Um, I may have got that wrong a little bit, but you get the mm -hmm. idea. This mm -hmm. is an automated program uh, that uses technology to identify uh, target information and sectionalize and open devices, uh, isolating fault in, faulted areas, and then energizing uh, from other sources all in an automated fashion within minutes. It, uh, as opposed to like back in the day, <laughs> I used to be a distribution operator. I ran the distribution grid and um, there was a lot of human intervention there. I had to analyze fault uh, information. I had to manually open and sectionalize devices. And then I had to manually close and energize and test. And that took a while uh, for me to do uh, because again, uh, you don't want to um, make a mistake. You don't want to energize a known faulted area. Mm -hmm. And so um, with as technology is, has moved on, we've been able to invoke uh, programs and, and technologies like Blizzard, as well as uh, the sort of uh, protection schemes that an LR provides in and of itself. Uh, as Robert mentioned, these line reclosers, they're set up with protective elements to detect uh, overcurrent conditions, over and under voltage conditions, over and under frequency conditions. Mm -hmm. um, sensitive ground fault conditions, uh, down conductor detection uh, conditions. So um, the better that we are able to exploit these features in our individual line reclosers and then put them in series with one another to have a uh, sort of blanket uh, uh, coverage of our grid with these LRs and strategic locations, uh, the better we can enable automatic features that that clear a fault and restore power in an automated fashion with less human intervention. Very good. Very interesting. Thank you. Robert, I want to come back to you. How is Omicron supporting utilities such as PG&E 
with the education and the solutions for successful implementation of fire mitigation programs? Sure, sure. Um, so I think Omicron as a company always tries its best to support these utilities such as PG&E, not only through the equipment and solutions that we provide, but also through education. I think we are quite proactive in terms of sharing knowledge through different events, articles, and other forms of media, such as this podcast, mm -hmm. um, by discussing you know various important topics that are popular in the industry, such as wildfire mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, we are able to share this information not only from our own technical experts, but also heavily rely on our utility partners who have a wealth of knowledge to share with their utility colleagues. Because at the end of the day, me as a product manager or any of our application or technical support engineers, we're not out in the field every day. And our utility partners are. So they sure. actually have the most knowledge when it comes mm -hmm. to this information. Okay, very good. Okay, now Justin mentioned that he uses Omicron system Arco. In your opinion, why is Arco a good solution for this application area? What makes it most appropriate for this type of work? So, I mean, as Justin mentions in the article for Omicron magazine, Arco 400 is used to validate the settings on a reclosure control. Mm -hmm. um, that is being used out in the field, right? So these rec recloser controls work together in conjunction with other line control devices to ensure that utilities are able to operate a safe, reliable, and efficient distribution grid, mm -hmm. especially when unexpected events occur. Okay. Where can our listeners get more information about ARCO? So shameless plug now. Um, more mm -hmm. information about ARCO 400 <laughs> can be found on our website www.omicronenergy.com. Um, this year, we will also be attending some in-person events such as IEEE, which is in April, as well as Distributech, which is in late May. Mm -hmm. So in case you are there and want to have some additional conversation, please stop by our booth. I believe for IEEE, it is booth number 6351. And for Distributech, it is booth number 3123. Well, thank you. Uh, Justin, are you going to be at any of these events? Yeah, we'll see. Um, very busy year, and this is our, our season to get prepared for PSPS and, and a new program called EPSS, uh, which is our Enhanced Power Line Safety Settings Program, uh, which I'll be speaking more on next week at the uh, Houston event, the 7th Annual Omicron Recloser event. Um, but that said, uh, I may be attending the Beckwith uh, con conference later this year. Uh, I had the pleasure of speaking there last year, mm -hmm. and uh, it went really well and got some good feedback and some uh, good partnerships were made. So, yeah, I'm always um, up for and excited to be a part of um, conferences like Distribute Tech and others. And I'm always willing to do so. Just uh, got to check with the big boss back at the big blue, make sure I'm available to be cut loose for those type of things. Sure, you certainly have enough to do. Well, Justin, Robert, thank you both for joining me for this discussion about enhancing fire safety at electrical utilities with the help of reclosure control testing and ARCO 400. Thanks, Scott. And thanks, Robert. Appreciate you guys. Yes, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Justin. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you both again. And a big thank you to our audience for listening to this episode of Energy Talks. We would really like to know what you think about our podcast and which topics you would like to hear more about in the future. Also, if you have questions about a particular episode for our guest experts, please let us know. To do this, simply send us an email to podcast at omicronenergy.com. We greatly appreciate your questions and feedback. Omicron has several years of experience in power system testing and offers you the matching solution for your application. This includes solutions for reclosure control testing, which was mentioned in this episode. For more information, be sure to visit our website at omicronenergy.com. Here, you can also find information about upcoming Omicron Academy webinars and training courses, as well as the latest issue of Omicron Magazine to keep up to date about the latest in power system testing. 
Please join us to listen to the next episode of Energy Talks. Goodbye for now, everyone. Thank you.